just came out with a report on the Postal Service's automation program. This is the first in a series of oversight hearings that are intended to provide members of Congress with an overview of the present state of operations of the nation's largest civilian employer. Congressman John McHugh of New York chairs the proceedings. Why don't uh, I call this uh, subcommittee meeting to order? Uh, we'll certainly uh, welcome the uh, addition of Ms. Collins when she arrives, but uh, I know that time is a significant factor and uh, we don't want to impose upon uh, the individuals who are here today uh, any more than we have to. Uh, today, the uh, subcommittee on postal service begins a series of general oversight hearings regarding the operation of the United States Postal Service. These sessions are intended to provide the members of the subcommittee with an overview of the present administrative and operational status of the nation's largest civilian employee, employer, the United States Postal Service. This morning we're honored to have before us the Postmaster General of the United States, Mr. Marvin Runyon. In addition, Mr. Mike Motley, who is the Associate Director of the General Accounting Office, will also present testimony, and it's my honor and privilege to welcome uh, both of those gentlemen here this morning. Thank you for being here, and also to welcome each and every one of you. Uh, certainly, the Postal Service has not lacked for media attention these past few months. Allegations of poor delivery, uh, unacceptable levels of service, and rate increases have led to calls for privatization and, unfortunately, a general lack of respect among much of the public for an institution that is literally as old as the Republic itself. At the same time, reports of more positive developments, uh, such as improvements in service standards and the fact that our Postal Service, for all of its perceived shortcomings and for all of the challenges that it faces each and every day, is still amongst the least expensive in the world. Those kinds of things seldom make the morning headlines. What many people too often forget is the breadth and the magnitude of the mandate for the Postal Service in our country. And while we will not attempt to gloss over the past uh, challenges and mistakes, I hope this series of hearings will provide the members of the subcommittee with the information to uh, allow them to determine the strengths and the we weaknesses of the Postal Service uh, and in order to aid the Congress in facilitating a higher standard of delivery and service to all postal customers. I look forward to Mr. Runyon updating the subcommittee members on a wide range of postal issues, particularly I hope progress can be reported to us today on the collective bargaining front. I know the Postmaster General has expressed his concerns regarding the inability of labor and management to reach collective bargaining agreements in the past, and we would welcome his perspective on what might be done to ameliorate this situation through f future negotiations. Another issue that certainly is of concern involves finances. With the recent uh, rate increase, the state of postal fiscal affairs should look good for the forthcoming year. However, the budget process and a host of other unforeseen circumstances could adversely affect the Postal Service's break-even point. And we're most interested as well in the Postmaster General's views on what the future might hold in this regard. I want to extend the subcommittee's appreciation for the appearance of our second witness, General Accounting Office Associate Director Mike Motley. The GAO has performed admirably in working with the uh, Postal Service and in the postal arena over the past few years, and I and the members of the subcommittee look forward to GAO's continuing cooperation with the Congress in its review and its analysis of postal operations. For the record, today's uh, meeting represents the first in a series of general oversight hearings to be conducted by the subcommittee. We've asked the Postal Rate Commission to appear before us next week, and we've scheduled a March 8th appearance before the subcommittee of the Postal Board of Governors. Uh, as a legislative body devoted exclusively to the oversight of the Postal Service, this subcommittee plans to scrutinize in depth virtually all phases of postal operations and services. Now, this will undoubtedly lead us into areas of inquiry that have often been totally ignored and even rejected in the past. 
while our dedication to probing all areas of postal operations might be unsettling to some, it is my belief that it is our solemn duty to the people of this nation to ensure that no legitimate question goes unasked and no valid argument goes unheard and unheeded. That has been the unofficial motto of this, the 104th Congress, and it will be the guiding principle of this subcommittee. And with that, I thank the witnesses again for their appearance here today, and we look forward to their testimony. At this time, I'd like to yield to the Honorable Barbara Rose Collins, gentlelady from Michigan, uh, who serves as the ranking minority member for the committee uh, for any opening remarks she might have. Ms. Collins. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I join you in welcoming our two panelists to the first of a series of oversight hearings on the Postal Service. As the former chairwoman of the Committee on Post Office and Civil, Ser Civil Service Subcommittee on Postal Operations and Services, I'm pleased that we are embarking on a sensible and comprehensive examination of postal services and operations. I note that the GAO report on automation was in response to my subcommittee request. <coughs> uh, Mr. Runyon and Motley are familiar with my concerns, and my concerns have not changed. I remain interested in the state of labor management relations at the <coughs> Postal Service, the status of technological innovations, the impact automation is having on the efficient delivery and handling of mail, or the inefficient delivery and handling of mail, and finally, the overall state of mail delivery in our cities and communities across the nation. In short, I too am concerned about the future of the Postal Service. To that end, I look forward to hearing from the Postmaster General and the GAO on matters affecting the delivery of mail. I thank you, Mr. Chairman, for your foresight, your approach, and dedication to a thorough airing of postal matters. Thank you, Ms. Collins. I uh, next yield to the Vice Chairman of the Subcommittee, the Honorable Mark Sanford, the gentleman from South Carolina. Uh, I'll keep it very brief and say that I look forward to uh, the testimony, and uh, I, I really have no opening comment. I think you've said everything that needs to be said from my end. Thank you very much. Uh, to his left, uh, to your right, is the uh, Honorable Gentleman from New York. Uh, not all of us honorable gentlemen are from New York, but he is, and uh, it's uh, Mr. Ben Gilman. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and uh, Chairman McHugh, I want to thank you for calling this first meeting in a series of hearings to address the issues that the Postal Service is going to have to be confronting in the coming months and years. And it's my hope that uh, in our subcommittee we'll be able to engage in a constructive dialogue to help improve the efficiency and customer service of what I consider an indispensable agency. And while I understand that every department of our federal government is, must be considered in our efforts to try to control a federal budget deficit, uh, we hope that as we embark on those efforts, we'll be keeping service, good service, uh, intact and that we will be honoring the commitments uh, we've made to our postal employees. Uh, I join in welcoming our Postmaster General, Mr. Runyon, and Mr. Michael Motley of the General Government uh, Division of the General Accounting Office to our <laughs> subcommittee. Uh, I welcome also uh, uh, Deputy Postmaster General Mike Coughlin, who's here with us, and uh, Bill Henderson, a Chief Operating Officer and Executive Vice President. I also want to welcome a number of our postmasters who are able to attend. They've been here uh, for several days of meetings in Washington. We look forward to hearing the testimony of the Postmaster General. Thank you, uh, Thank Mr. You, Chairman. Mr. Gilman. Uh, next, I yield to the gentleman from Connecticut, Mr. Chris Shea. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I just uh, would uh, add my voice to um, the appreciation for you holding these hearings and to uh, uh, thank Mr. Runyon and your people for being here. I think you have an extraordinarily difficult task, and I would like to feel that uh, Congress can help you in that effort rather than being a hindrance. My ultimate hope is that you can uh, do the job with less people and, and uh, provide better service, and uh, I know that you won't be reluctant in letting us know how we can help in that effort. Thank you. Uh, just uh, for some general ground rules, we had hoped to have a five-minute light, but we're told that uh, with all the other lights, those lights don't work in here. So uh, we would just ask that as we go through the rounds of questioning, uh, uh, if, uh, if the members could try to contain uh, their questions so that we might go through uh, several rounds and we'll try to ensure that everyone has an opportunity to address questions uh, to the Postmaster General. Uh, also, uh, we have been informed by letter that uh, it is the custom of the uh, 
Oversight Committee to uh, swear in all witnesses uh, to appear before the, either the full committee or the subcommittee. So with that, uh, uh, if you gentlemen would rise and stand with me and we'll administer the oath. Raising your right hand, do you solemnly swear the testimony you will give before this subcommittee will be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? Thank you. <clears throat> With the preliminaries out of the way, we would now uh, again welcome the Postmaster General, Mr. Marvin Runyon, uh, and allow him to make the formal introductions of the two gentlemen who have accompanied him. Uh, uh, General Runyon, welcome, and we look forward to your testimony, sir. Good morning, Mr. Chairman and, and members of the subcommittee. With me today are Mike Coughlin, a Deputy Postmaster General on my left, and Bill Henderson, Chief Operating Officer and Executive Vice President on my right. We're glad to be here this morning. Uh, we've got good news to share with you and the American people. I'm encouraged by the effort of our employees and the progress they've made in raising our performance. It's no secret that we had problems last year, particularly in a few of our larger cities. Service were off, was off, our customers were concerned. We responded by adjusting our management structure, focusing on the basics, and working more closely with major mailers. We have a lot more work to do but our folks have come a long way in the past year. I'm also encouraged by the support that we're getting from mailers across the country. Companies large and small are bringing us their business in record levels and working closely with us to make sure it gets delivered quickly and consistently. And I'm encouraged by the spirit of change that's in the air. The 104th Congress and the administration have the opportunity to, to change the federal government on a historic scale. We stand ready to help in any way we can to make government more businesslike and responsive to the American people. This morning, I had the pleasure of welcoming most of you to the Postal Service. We're what government service is all about. No other organization touches more lives and provides more livelihoods than does the Postal Service. That's because no other company does what we do, servicing everyone, everywhere, every day. The American people count on the mail to communicate and exchange information. American businesses count on the mail to bring customers in the door and dollars to the bottom line. We're talking big business, too. Companies marketing their products and services invested $29.3 billion in the mail in 1994, putting us in a virtual three-way tie with television and newspapers for the American advertising dollar. They made the sale by mail, too. Consumers spent more than $200 billion in mail order purchases last year. America depends on the mail. To meet that responsibility, I think we have to accomplish three things. We have to serve the nation, run like a business, and keep an eye on the future. We're doing a pretty good job meeting the first mandate, serving the nation. We visit 125 million addresses every workday, providing fair, economical access to 261 million Americans. And our people are doing it better than ever. 84% of all local first-class mail is being delivered overnight, tying our best performance ever. Tests by the media from the Washington Post to the LA Times show even better results. The 1994 Christmas season was the best on record, with customers ranging from Advo to Walmart praising the efforts of our employees. Financially, we're on solid ground. Through the first five months of our fiscal year, we have a preliminary net income of $531 million, well ahead of forecast. Revenue is up, driven by a 5.3% increase in mail volume, yet at the same time, expenses are running $176 million under operating projections. Postal employees nationwide are doing a fine job in terms of both bottom line performance and top-line concern for customers. They care about their communities. They care about their neighbors. It shows in their performance. They are reminding us that serving the nation one address at a time, every day, consistently, promptly, carefully, is important, worthwhile work. They're doing a good job. That brings me to the second mandate, running the Postal Service like a business. In the last two and a half years, we've made improvements in this area, too. We restructured our organization, saving a billion dollars a year without resorting to layoffs. We held rates steady for four years, saving the American people $14 billion. And we kept the eventual increase two percentage points below inflation. 
The Postal Reorganization Act of 1970 has served us well, creating a new breed of government organization, a business-like public service. But the law never envisioned today's highly competitive communications industry. To a large degree, it puts our destiny outside of our control. Regulatory oversight is appropriate, but it should not impair our ability to serve customers and provide them with products they want at market prices. It's time for us to re-examine the 25-year-old law that created this organization. It's time for us to take the next step to make the Postal Service more businesslike and competitive for the American people. There are three areas we need to focus on. First, we need to free our employees from burdensome rules and bureaucratic red tape and focus their efforts on serving our customers' mailing needs. Second, we need to free the price setting process so we can respond to the market, stay competitive, and keep costs down. And third, we need to free our products of bureaucratic restrictions and make them more modern and customer oriented. Let's take them one at a time, starting with our people. We have the largest civilian workforce in the nation. We set wages and work rules through collective bargaining, but it's clear after 20 years that the process is broken. For the fourth time in the last six labor contracts, we're headed toward a settlement dictated by arbitrators, outsiders, people who aren't accountable to postal customers. The methods for settling employee disputes also aren't working. They lead to multiple appeals on the same issue. They produce different outcomes in similar situations. It simply doesn't pay to make a federal case out of every workplace dispute, not for employees, managers, and especially our customers who get stuck with a tab. We must have a system that promotes cooperation and agreement. The second area we need to change is prices. The price setting process is out of sync with the speed and direction of modern business. It takes too long, it costs too much, and it's too inflexible. We're required to prepare a court case and present it to the Postal Rate Commission. The paperwork for the last one filled more than 50 boxes. The Commission studies the, the filing. They hear testimony from customers. Competitors lobby to raise our prices so they can raise theirs. Then the Commission deliberates and eventually recommends new rates. All told, it takes more than a year, and that's no way to run a business. While we have to spend months revealing proprietary business information to justify new rates, other companies can act overnight. They skim the cream from new business opportunities. We have to wait for the chance to compete. Outside charges have also impacted the prices postal customers must pay. Through 1998, the Postal Service will have paid $14 billion to reduce the federal deficit since 1987. Some are now proposing that the Postal Service pre-fund its health care costs. However, this would cost the Postal Service at least $11.6 billion and have a devastating impact on our finances. It would force us to file a new rate case seeking at least a two-cent hike in the first-class stamp and similar increases in other types of mail. It would hurt our competitiveness and undercut the progress we've made. It's the wrong way to go. Together, we can correct this situation. We can avoid future assessments on postal ratepayers. We can simplify the rate setting process while maintaining appropriate oversight and make it faster and much less expensive. We can make our prices more market-based and competitive. The rewards could be great. With enough business latitude, I believe one day we could become a profit center for the federal government. The third area of change is our products. Frankly, much of our product line is out of touch with the market. In many cases, you pay for what you're sending, not when you want it to get there. Postal regulations are still too complicated and weighty. With changes in the law, we can get the pricing flexibility we need and the freedom to bring new products to market faster. Our last mandate may be the most important. Keep an eye on the future. America needs the mail today, tomorrow, and for decades to come. We have a responsibility to provide for the nation's present and future communication needs. We must continue to improve our delivery timeliness and keep our costs low and competitive. Mr. Chairman, our employees are working to do just that. 
In addition, customers are asking us to support their use of electronic communications. People want their electronic mail to be as private and secure as the letters we deliver today. With the help of some leading edge technology firms, we've developed an electronic postmark. It will validate and safeguard America's email messages backed by some of the toughest tampering laws in the land. And starting this spring, we'll begin testing a combination of electronic and hard copy mail. Working with some major customers, we'll use our mail scanning equipment to notify business customers today that this month's order or last month's payment is on the way. This new product will help companies manage their cash flow and operations better and lower their costs. We need to keep our positive momentum going. Hundreds of thousands of postal employees are doing a great job delivering for the American people. With the help of this subcommittee, they can do so much more. With the right changes in the laws and regulations, we can continue to provide the communications safety net, mail service to everyone, everywhere, every day. And we can do a much better job of operating like a business, making ourselves more competitively fit for the future. Done right, these changes can benefit the entire nation, bringing better service quality and lower prices. The Postal Service can deliver excellence to the American people and continue to be one part of government that pays its own way. Mr. Chairman, we look forward to working with you and the members of this subcommittee to deliver a new Postal Service, one that can deliver excellence in the next century. Thank you. Thank you. General Ryan, Ryan, I appreciate that. Uh, if I could just begin with a, a few questions and then go down the line on the committee. Uh, obviously, as you noted in your testimony and as uh, you have said in other forums, the <coughs> environment within which the Postal Service operates has changed dramatically over the past 15 years, and yet uh, the Reorganization Act of 1970 has not kept pace, uh, or at least has not changed uh, along with those uh, developments in your environment. Uh, in, in the interest of trying to help the subcommittee think about specifics, uh, are you prepared or do you have any suggestions as to what kinds of amendments to the, re to the Reorgan Reorganization Act might be helpful to you in achieving the goals that you outlined in your testimony? Mr. Chairman, we don't have specific written law that we'd like to propose to you, but we think that what it should contain is help us to control our costs better. Uh, we need to look at all the areas of cost control that we have and look at the areas where we could control better if we didn't have regulations uh, that we have. Uh, we need to be able to operate more competitively. And in general, we just need to run like a business. Uh, and there are several areas that we would like to discuss with the committee and, and with other people in government to determine how we can get those things changed. Some of it may take legislation, some of it may not. It may just take uh, a reduction of regulations. Mm -hmm. Well, obviously, we'd be very interested in exploring those with you. Uh, the, the principles and the objectives that you outline, it, it at least seems to me, I can't speak for the subcommittee members uh, as a whole, but are reasonable. and, and uh, on paper, they, they certainly would seem to represent something that would be a desirable objective uh, for us to, to be uh, of assistance to you. Uh, but we do as well uh, need your guidance and your input. And so we would be anxious, uh, very anxious, at the earliest possible uh, moment to try to begin to look at those. And whether they be regulatory, where we can put some sort of uh, pressure or, or give a sense of the subcommittee as to those needed changes or whether to be legislative, we are prepared, anxious uh, to work with you uh, in, in that regard. Uh, to say that you need to operate like a business uh, uh, certainly makes sense, but there are some uh, unique uh, attributes about the Postal Service that insulates it from outside competition, the express statutes uh, and others. Thinking for a moment about the, uh, about the process of affecting a change in your rate structure, uh, I have met with uh, a few of the members of the rate commission and, and they felt that given the very uh, clear and complex charge that they are given, in other words, protecting the interest of all mailers and providing the people who are most affected, your ratepayers, with the opportunity 
to participate in the process, to go through the hearings, uh, they feel uh, is, is an important component of, of, the entire, of the entire mechanism. How do you think we might restructure that rate making process so that it, it, it reaches a balance of responding to the interests of, of the postal customers uh, while at the same time providing you with some kind of flexibility so you can react in a more market oriented way? Well, I think there, there are several ways that could happen. I've been talking with the, the chairman of the uh, Postal Rate Commission, uh, Ed Lyman, about this. So there are things such as us having a product that we want to deliver, and we could do that on an experimental basis with their agreement and, and go out and start to do that uh, rather rapidly. Uh, and we're working on how we would set about to do that. If we could do that, that would be a, a big help to us. Uh, there are things that, uh, that come to mind, and that is if, if we didn't raise rates above the rate of inflation, um, that might be another way to do that. Uh, in the past, our rates have been above the rate of inflation. This past uh, rate <coughs> increase that we gave after four years uh, was two points below the rate of inflation, and we intend to keep our increases below the rate of inflation. So I think there are several ways that we could agree together to do that and um, I'm going to be meeting with the, the chairman of the Postal Rate Commission. He's, he's anxious to meet and I'm anxious to meet so we can discuss those things and find out how far we can go without legislation um, because that, that would be the best way to do it. So in other words, what you're at least discussing now uh, would be a system wherein if, if the proposed rate increase were below the determined rate of inflation, there would be no hearing process at all? I'm saying that's one approach that we could take. Uh, I don't know that the Postal Rate Commission would like that, but that's, that's an approach that I think that we might be able to look at. And I think there are others that we need to look at, but we need to, to meet with the Postal Rate Commission and have those discussions and then come back with you and tell you where we are. Okay. Well, uh, we would wait that uh, input as well. And there again, uh, where you have the opportunity to negotiate with the Rate Commission uh, is certainly of interest to the subcommittee, but that is at least um, at the first uh, instance between you and the commission. Mm -hmm. But where there are legislative inhibitors that uh, we could make changes in statute that would accommodate that balance, because I certainly am concerned that the people of this nation or and the postal customers have some opportunity to respond to, to your proposals of, of rate adjustments. Uh, whereas providing that flexibility would be important. I have any number of other questions, but I know the other members do as well, and uh, I would at this time uh, yield to uh, the ranking minority member, the gentlelady from Michigan, Ms. Collins. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I have about three questions I want to ask you. Um, in your statement, you said, with the right changes in the laws and regulations, we can continue to provide the uh, communication safety net and you've spoken about the need for legislation quite often publicly. And just be more specific. What do you want in legislation? Well, what we want are to accomplish the things that I think we need to do. We need flexibility in our operation. Uh, we need to be free to operate like a business. Uh, we need to be free to, to make financial investments uh, that are appropriate for a $55 billion company to make. Uh, to this point, you cannot make investments at No, this the, point. Treasury, the Treasury Department oversees us in that regard. Do you get the results of it? Well, let me uh, let Mike Coughlin mention that. He knows more about, uh, about that subject the in detail. The Treasury does control basically all aspects of, uh, of our investments of, uh, of any excess funds in the, po in the postal fund itself. Uh, and right now, we are limited to uh, uh, the investment in non-marketable uh, Treasury securities, at a, at a market rate that are tied to, to uh, things on the market, and we do retain the earnings off of that. I think what uh, part of what Mr. Runyon is referring to is the flexibility and, and some of the opportunities that exist beyond that very narrow uh, uh, opportunity to use, uh, use those funds. I think there are a lot of opportunities out there, particularly in today's marketplace, that are safe but at the same time have the potential to, to pay off for the Postal Service. You would have lost your shirt last year if you had that flexibility. <laughs> Along this is an Orange us. County. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. um, GAO has found that black males in the Postal Service were four times more likely to be investigated by the Postal Inspection Service for narcotics violations than white males. Uh, we had a hearing on that, I believe. 
Have you investigated this disparate treatment? Yes, we have, and as uh, you're familiar, since the, the Cleveland Sting operation, uh, we have changed the way we do uh, those investigations. We don't have uh, uh, people that we hire uh, in paid informants anymore. Mm -hmm. uh, w I don't think that our investigations are racial biased. Uh, we do have reports from the uh, Inspector General to the board. Mm -hmm. uh, on a recurring basis to make sure that uh, we're, we've accomplished what we need to accomplish in that regard. So it's not racial, it's just um, happenstance that they investigate more blacks Yes, we've whites. investigated, uh, of, of the investigations we've had, 91% uh, of, the, of the cases that we presented to the Attorney General, they have accepted. And 93% uh, of the ones that accepted uh, have had favorable rulings against the, uh, the people who were, were guilty of drugs. So I think they're doing a fairly good job of how they go about it. I understand that the diversity department covers more than affirmative action. What other areas are covered by this department? Well, they're responsible for helping all of our operations in the field set up programs uh, to make sure that we have diversity in, in the total area. Uh, we have a diversity in our, tr in our purchasing, in our facilities arena, and it's their responsible to make sure that we've got programs set up and, and follow that. Uh, I might say that the Postal Service is probably the most diverse organization in government and, and perhaps in the country. Do they have enough resources in the field to do their job? Yes, they, they have enough resources. As a matter of fact, uh, we're adding uh, some resources in the field. Mike, will you tell us how many right, we're doing? Right that? now, uh, uh, Ms. Collins, we're in the process of adding 25 additional uh, diversity development specialists uh, so that we have at least one in every one of our districts around the country. We'll have a total of 85 at that point. Mm -hmm. Does the diversity vice president have in terms of making changes or implementing um, what level of authority does the vice president have in terms of making changes or well, he implementing has the changes, authority. especially where the people might not accept change? He has the authority at this time to, to set programs up, uh, to recommend actions to people. Uh, he has the authority, of course, to come to me since he reports directly to me if he's not getting uh, the right cooperation that he needs. He does not have the authority to override all of the operating managers mm -hmm. in the company. I might add to that that the real responsibility for diversity rests with the line managers who make those selections. This is not really a, it's not a staff function in the sense all of the burden lies on our diversity vice president. Really line, it really is on the shoulders of people that report to me all the way down through the Postal Service to keep diversity in mind. And, and uh, Bob really acts as a, as a very close advisor to us in accepting that responsibility. Thank you, Mr. Henderson. I'll save the rest of my questions. Thank you, Ms. Collins. I yield to the Vice Chairman, the uh, gentleman from South Carolina, Mr. Sam. Uh, Mr. Runyon, uh, we touched on this during our last visit. Now, I want to revisit it after uh, listening to your testimony, and that is, as I heard you go through the different friction points in terms of running the post office effectively, uh, what I heard was a, a real desire for flexibility, uh, the need to be able to shift uh, as different situations came along, a real desire to ma uh, be free to make your own financial investments as you saw fit, um, a desire to be free of the red tape uh, and rules that, that uh, have burdened you in terms of collective bargaining, um, need to do price setting on your own. Right now the mechanism <laughs> is so slow and so inflexible. Many would argue, well, if these are the things that you need, why not privatize the post office? Uh, wouldn't that be an effective vehicle for allowing you the, the freedom that you need? What's wrong with that argument? And again, I'm not speaking on behalf of any of my uh, fellow subcommittee members, but just in terms of following that rationale out. Well, if, if you mean by privatizing the post office to put a for sale sign in the window of every post office and, and sell it to the highest bidder, I'd be very much against it. I don't think that uh, there's an organization uh, or a company in this country that uh, is supported by Wall Street that is capable of doing what we do, mm -hmm. of giving universal service at a uniform price to every citizen in the United States and territories also. Uh, if you mean, though, um, by that term, uh, that you would like to commercialize 
the Postal Service so that we can operate more like a private corporation, which, by the way, the law stated in the beginning, that's the way it should be. We should be a government agency, but run like a, pub, a private corporation. Mm -hmm. uh, but we're not allowed to do that. Uh, and if that's what you mean, then I would be very much in favor of it. As a matter of fact, that's what we're asking for. So in essence, you're asking for partial privatization, so to speak, privatization of maybe different I, functions. I, uh, I don't like to call it privatization. I like to call it uh, commercialization. Uh, privatization has uh, a bad connotation to employees in the Postal Service, and uh, I, I, I don't like that term. Sure. Uh, uh, you you like it, but I don't. <laughs> no, I'm not saying that I, I necessarily I, I, like it at all. I just yeah. know the folks back home, one of the things they uh, consistently get frustrated with is they, they look at the consistent chains that anybody who works within government has to work with. And they keep saying, Mark, uh, w why don't you have uh, this function or that function or a post office free mm -hmm. of those constraints that government always entails? Mm -hmm. Well, that's what we're asking for. Free us of those restraints and we'll operate it much better. Mm -hmm. Good other questions, but again, uh, let me defer to my fellow members. A gentleman from New York, Mr. Gilman. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I thank the Postmaster General and Mr. Anderson and Mr. Coughlin for coming and giving us the best of your thinking. I want to commend the Postal Service, first of all, for coming out in uh, black instead of the red. And uh, one of the things uh, I've been concerned about over the years is the uh, uh, reserve that the Postal service has. Can you tell us a little bit about uh, where you are on the reserve right now? And uh, I think your equity has uh, uh, declined to six billion, uh, declined some six billion since 1986. And a lot of that happened during the past couple years. Uh, oh, can you tell us what your thoughts are about that reduction in equity? Yes, uh, we think that uh, we need to get rid of the negative equity. Uh, we're setting in place programs to do that. It won't be done overnight. Uh, to do it overnight would mean we'd have to go for a very large rate increase to, to write that off. Uh, but we are uh, con dedicated to not running a negative profit or a loss. Um, the way the, the rates have been set in the Postal Service is normally on a three-year cycle. And you, you, you figure it on... Uh, a case year, and you figure that year out, and you take the economics of that year, and so that's what the postage stamps come out to be. That means that the first year that that new rate is in effect, you're profitable. The second year, uh, you break even. In the third year, you run a loss. Well, that loss, uh, you know, goes to the negative equity. Well, what, what can we do to correct that? Well, what we intend to do is not run a loss. I think we need to do what we have to do to never run a loss again. Uh, we just made a, uh, a change in rates on January the 1st of this year. Uh, to present time, we're $500 million ahead of that, and we think we're going to do better than that. Uh, our in indications are that next year we will also have a profit. Providing we, we don't take a skim out that amount well, if you for take, prepayment. If you take 11.6 million or billion out, you will raise the equity by 11.6 billion. So that's one way to keep that equity down, is to not take 11.6 billion, because it'll go right to our bottom line. The minute that that is, you reduce the equity, not raise it. Yes, I think you misspoke. Well, spoken. it'll be yeah. more negative. Yes. Uh, it'll be go from six to 11. Yes. 11.6 be 17.6. That equity would become. So naturally, we're going to have to go and raise rates in in that event. Um, what can we do about cutting back on the time of uh, raising rates and the consideration by the Well, what we're doing now is that we raised our rates. We think that this rate increase will last for two years before we would have to take a loss. If we do a better job of, of improving our productivity and things of that nature, we might go three years without a loss. But we need to look at that and make sure that if we're going to have a loss, then we have to go Oh, we have to make that decision probably 10 months um, for the commission and probably four months for us. So about 14 months ahead, we have to make a decision. Are we going to make a profit the third year or not? If we're not, we're going to have to go in for a rate increase. And that's pretty difficult to predict at that uh, length of time, is it not? Well, a lot of things can happen in, um, in, in 14 months. What can we do to 
shorten the time of consideration of rates by the Postal Rate Commission. You talk about it needs to be simplified. What are your thoughts about how to go about that? Well, I, I think that the, the amount of time that is put into that should be cut back. And, and there are a lot of ways to do that, and that would be, uh, you know, perhaps have less time for intervention, have people prepared and, 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 and do a faster job of that. Uh, I think the Postal Rate Commission would be in a better position to explain how they could cut times. Now, they did a good job for us and with us on this last rate increase. They cut the time to nine months, and that was very, very helpful to us, and we're very appreciative to them for doing that. So we need to work together to figure out how best to do that, and, and then when we figure that out, we'll get back with you. You talk, uh, uh, Postmaster General, about re-examining the Postal Reorganization Act to try to make it more business-like. Any specific recommendations with regard to the act itself? Well, I'm not prepared to give specifics now, but the things that we need to, to address is how we are affected by various other agencies in the U.S. government. You know, for example, uh, Office of Personnel Management uh, sort of controls how we deal with people to a certain degree. Uh, Merit System Protection Board is an appeal process uh, that we go through. Uh, we can't go to the Merit System Protection Board ourselves as management of the Postal Service. We have to go through OPM. If OPM agrees with us, then they carry it forward. If they don't, it doesn't go forward. Uh, so if we could get more control over what we do, if we weren't under the office of OPM, for example, uh, that would be very good. Now, the, uh, the person head of the office of personnel management, I think, agrees with me. On that. I would hope you might send some of these recommendations to our subcommittee, and, and we'd welcome considering them. I'm sure our chairman would welcome having those. Okay. Well, uh, just one other thought, and I know my time is running. If some of our postmasters who we met with during this past week have said they need a little more flexibility. They're getting too many regulations that hamper their efficient uh, operations. And uh, have you looked at that at all? Uh, they feel that uh, the, the, the amount of regulations being imposed, imposed on them restricts their efficiency. We certainly do look at that. We need to look at it more. A lot of those regulations they're talking about, we inflict on them, not not Congress or yes. anybody else. It's us, and uh, we're improving that. We've done better, but we need to do more. Mm, I would we're hope you might not meet through. with a group of postmasters just to review some of those. I think it could be helpful to them and to the Postal Service. Again, we thank you for appearing, and we hope together we can help make our process more efficient and make it more financially uh, solvent. Thank you. Thank, thank you, you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. Uh, gentleman from uh, Connecticut, Mr. Shea. Uh, thank you, and thank you, uh, Mr. Postmaster, again for being here. I'm going to ask you a number of questions. I, they may not require too long an answer. Um, the, I, I, first, to make a point to you, I, I believe the pre-funding of, of the health care benefits is a dead issue. I serve on the Budget Committee. I, I have that task force overseeing the health care issue, and uh, we would strongly oppose it in our group within the Budget Committee. It, it really is a gimmick that the Congressional Budget Office had suggested, and I think they've retracted their recommendation. So um, I don't think it has support, and I don't think it would pass. I'm glad to hear that. Uh, with regard to uh, mail being delivered, um, uh, quite often in my area in New England, uh, the, the carriers don't get out until 9.30 to 10.30. And I've, I've just often wondered why we couldn't uh, get them out at 8.30 in the morning. Is that a goal? What is the goal of when you get the carriers out delivering mail? I'd like to ask uh, Bill Henderson to respond to that since he's responsible for that part of the operation. The, the carriers have basically uh, two roles in, uh, during the day. The first is to sort their mail in the order of delivery. And depending on the arrival time of that, that's the time that they are allowed to sort their mail or have to sort it and then go to the street. With the advent of automation, uh, we are opening greater processing windows within the plants, and, it's, and the carriers are actually getting delayed. What's the goal of getting them out? By what time? Uh, generally by about 11 o'clock. Yeah. Why so late? Because we need the processing window to sequence the mail for them. Why not just tie them to start earlier? I, I, my sense is if the post office is truly competing with, with another post office, 
you would have your men out by 9 o'clock. You would, you would restructure the system, and you would get your workers there sooner, and you would get the mail flowing sooner to get them out. And um, so I guess I'm just curious why you wouldn't have an earlier goal. It's a function of the, it's a function of the processing window that you have to sort the mail. You, you collect it, for example, it begins at the collection point. You collect it at the conclusion of business in America which is sometime after 5 o'clock. And then you have from that point on to get it to its destination and then to get it in delivery sequence. It is possible to restructure routes, for example, in many areas of the country we're looking at that, to get business mail earlier in the day to businesses. And I think that's the driving force for earlier delivery. And, but residential mail, people who are at work, for example, uh, we have extended that to try to reconstruct those routes and provide, they will be provided later delivery. The GAO, um, I guess, today, is uh, talking about the whole issue of, of um, your automation system that was to pre-sort the letters so the carriers would only have to spend, uh, we could spend two hours less mm -hmm. sorting out the mail. Um, are you in agreement with this report? Uh, we'll be hearing later from them. D d um, do you, do you well, to the degree that, and, and I haven't spent a great deal of time yet studying that report, but to the degree that, that they talk about the complexity of implementing automation, we are. But we think in terms of uh, the gains of the Postal Service, if you go back, for example, and take automation out of the system, we know for what mail volumes and what workload we had. So you go back to 1988, you take mail, the automation out of the system. If we did not have automation, we would have spent in excess of $5 billion more money. Well, let me ask you then more specific because time will run out. Are we behind schedule in this process? Yes. Okay. Do you have uh, special plans to bring us back in line or will it, are, are you, have you readjusted your time frames? We've readjusted the time okay. frames. What has been the biggest cause of the delay? Two causes. The first cause is the multi-line uh, optical character reader uh, actually not uh, performing as we thought it would along with some um, bypassing of GMFs by mailers uh, because of some logistics changes. And the second reason is the remote encoding uh, was delayed. It was involved in a major labor dispute and a major review by the board, and it did not meet. Uh, am, I, am I right in assuming, though, that if you could get the system to, to work in your post office systems that you will have the carriers spending more time delivering and getting out sooner? That's correct. Okay. Um, do I have a few more seconds here? Just. Uh, just some very simple things that maybe you get asked often. Does first class cover subsidized third classes? My constituents make assumptions. No. Okay. So the, basically, every every pricing mechanism carries its own weight. That's the requirement of of the uh, rate process. Yes. Um, other questions, but I I will yield back my time and thank you very much. Um, I, 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 could I just ask one? Sure. There was a report last year of the GAO, uh, critical of the postal system. Uh, how do you, how is, the, Mr. Ryan, how have you responded to that? Is that, am I accurate on that issue? Um, are you talking about the Labor Management Relations report? Yeah. Uh, I think the report was pretty well on target. We need to improve our, our labor um, management relations, and we're, we're setting about to do that. Um, we, as a matter of fact, uh, at a, a hearing uh, that we had with the Senate uh, last year, I asked that a, um, a summit meeting be held between all of the uh, labor unions and the management associations and the Postal Service. And uh, we still would like to have that summit. At the present time, uh, we've got three labor unions that don't wish to enter into that summit, and they would like to wait until the negotiations are over, uh, which, which are not over. Uh, I'm very anxious to get into that and, and to sit down with all concerned and try to figure out a better way to operate than what we've been operating for many, many years. Okay. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you. As a follow-up to that, as I recall, the GAO recommended that uh, you seek outside help. Uh, and perhaps this is what you were just referring to. Have you requested help from anyone like the Federal Mediation and Consolation Service to? assist in your forging a long-term agreement with Yes, we agent. have. As a matter of fact, uh, we would have desired to have the Federal Mediation, uh, uh, some people from Federal Mediation Board to set in our negotiations. 
but that wasn't possible. We couldn't reach agreement uh, with our unions to have that happen. I think that would be a very good way for us to work on that. Uh, at the present time, we are meeting with the Federal Mediation Board and one of our unions uh, to try to reach agreement b without having to go to arbitration. Uh, so, yes, we're very much in favor of having the, the Mediation Board involved in any discussions that we have along this nature. We think they'd be very constructive. How, how is your current mediation progressing? Uh, slowly. Slowly. Well, uh, you, you mentioned uh, the arduous process in your view of, of obtaining a rate increase and how you have to prospectively look down the road and because of the length of time it takes 14 months I believe you said you have to contemplate rate increases very early on. Are you contemplating a rate increase uh, at this time for the future? No, we're not contemplating a rate increase right now. The 11.6 billion would force us into a, an immediate rate increase, but uh, hopefully we won't have to do that. Well, th I certainly take uh, the gentleman from Connecticut's word on that, but le let's let's think about it for a moment. <laughs> uh, you you've expressed very understandable concern about what that pre-funding requirement would do to your to your the price of a stamp. Uh, dream with me a nightmare, if you will, from your view and many others, if indeed the pre-funding had a clause in it that prohibited you from passing any of that along to stamp, and you would have to take that out of operating. What kinds of steps would that require you to take? Have you even had a thought about that? I haven't had that nightmare yet. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, it would, uh, I, I tell you, it would be uh, very bad for service for, um, for customers, uh, regardless of, of how we did it. It's going to affect service. Uh, you know, I, I haven't really tried to figure out the, the many different ways that we'd have to, or steps we'd have to take to do that, but it would be tremendous uh, to reduce a $55 billion budget by 20% in one year. That would be very hard to do. It would be very hard for any private company to do. Mm -hmm. um, private companies uh, have a little more leeway in what they can do. For example, they might lay off 20 percent of their, their operations. A private company might uh, close down 20 percent of their plants. Uh, we can't do that. Uh, so it would be a little more disastrous for us than it would for a private company. I might add to that. Yes, sir. Chairman, I was here in 1987 when the, when, uh, the OBRA of that year was passed, and, and one of the provisions of that limited the, the Postal Service, and I think it hit us for about $700 million. $700 million as opposed to 11.6. And it forced us into some operating actions that really had a devastating effect on the system. Uh, we were forced to, uh, to, to hold off, for, for example, entirely on our capital building program, and to this day there are post offices out there that have not been built, that are badly needed, because of an action that took place in 1987 that involved over $700 million. So if you, I think you can see what the magnitude of the, of the kind of, of impact that might have if you, if you uh, multiplied that by some 15 times and put it up in the, five, the $11 or $12 billion range. It would be devastating to the system. Fine. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Mr. Runyon, you are a member of... Uh, the 11 member board of governors that oversee the postal service operations that structure was established again like most of what you do today uh, back in 19, 1970. Uh, how well do you feel that board of governors structure particularly as it as it interfaces with with the charge that you have before you in running the day-to-day -day operations of postal service works in today's it, world? I think it works very well. It, it works like uh, a board of directors in any company at, uh, at Ford Motor Company where I worked for a long time. We had a board of directors. Uh, some were outside uh, members and some were inside members. We have two inside members on that board and we have nine outside members. Uh, the membership doesn't change rapidly, as you know, because each member is appointed to a nine-year term. Uh, and so there's one new member appointed every year. So there's no rapid change on that board that would cause it to come in and change all the policies that have been established by a future board or, or past board. So uh, I think it works very well. It works like uh, any, any private organization would work. So in, uh, with respect to that, 
portion of the 1970 Act, you wouldn't contemplate any kinds of changes to the statute? To no, I, I don't think that that's necessary at all. Okay, good. Uh, again, I have other questions, but I uh, yield to Ms. Collins. Mr. Chairman, um, with your approval, I'd rather give the rest of mine in writing Certainly. so that, uh, because we still have Mr. Motley. Yes, we do. Testify. Uh -huh. right. Well, no, if it's all right, without yeah. objection, certainly. Um, San Sanford. I'm sorry. Uh, two quick questions. Um, one, many have argued that what you're really in is not the uh, postal business, but the information business, and that uh, as such, there in there's increasing competition in the information business, whether it's email or uh, mm -hmm. the cost of phone rate coming down, and that therefore. Uh, Given the constraints under which you operate uh, and, and your rising price relative to their falling price, I'm not saying your price is rising, but mm -hmm. relatively speaking, that uh, the post office may go the way of the buggy whip if we don't do r radical surgery to the way that you all operate. Do you buy into that theory or no? Well, that's a theory that's been around for a, a lot of years. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, for example, uh, when Telegraph was invented, uh, people said the Postal Service is going out of business. Mm -hmm. uh, telephone came in, the same thing. Computers came in uh, 20 years ago and they said that's the end of the Postal Service. Mm -hmm. uh, we have continued to increase. Our volume right now is increasing. Mm -hmm. uh, we increased uh, over the last two years a little over 6%, something like 6.5%. Right. This year our volume has increased 5.3%. Now, having said that, we are losing portions of our mail. Uh, on our um, financial and transaction mail. We've lost 35% of that in the last five years, and we expect to lose another 35% in the next four or five years. That is business to business mail, mm -hmm. and we expect to continue to lose that. But we are increasing mail in uh, customer to business and business to customer. That mail is increasing, mm -hmm. uh, and it's increasing a lot more than what we're losing. Uh, I think that there will be more of that going on. I think we will probably be in part of that business. For example, uh, several agencies in the federal government have come to us and said we would like for, to work with you and uh, set up a way to communicate through the post office. Okay. And we have designed some kiosks and uh, we're in the process of uh, looking at putting about 100 of those out in various post offices and see how they operate. So people can deal with uh, 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 Social Security, deal with the mm -hmm. Veterans Administration through uh, that kiosk in the post office, arranging so they can actually get checks through there. So with a smart card, they can put the smart card in there and get their check, and so a check doesn't have to be written. So mm -hmm. some of that's going to go away. But then on the other hand, that kiosk provides revenue for the Postal Service. So there are things like that that we're looking at because we are in the, uh, the communications business. Right. We're, we're having uh, companies come to us, large communication companies, and say, we need some help uh, because we can communicate with ourselves and do it w in a coded way, but when we want to communicate with another company, it has to go over the open wires and anybody can reach out and grab it. Well, we can put a, uh, a postmark on there electronic postmark, and then they can't reach out and do that. If they do, uh, they violate the federal law. Mm -hmm. And so we're working with people now and, and hope uh, soon uh, to have more to say about that. Mr. Chairman, would I have time for one other question? Certainly. Uh, not to be on the uh, commercialization uh, <laughs> kick, as you say, or privatization <laughs> kick. H how, how I understand Australia privatized or quasi-privatized their post office. Uh, if so, did, h how is that working? Is it working all right? What have you all heard? Um, I've heard some. I think Bill knows more about that subject than I do. Right. In, uh, there are several foreign administrations that are in one stage or another of privatization. Most of those are, are being proposed by postal management. Uh, 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 Graham John is the what's called the director general there, and, and they're very happy with, uh, with their structure. Uh, New Zealand is doing the same thing. Uh, UK is attempting to do it. The Netherlands, Sweden. There are, there are various phases of that going on. And they range in changes. Uh, uh, I think only one has given up the monopoly. The rest of them keep the monopoly. 
and it, uh, var it varies in being able to be more businesslike, uh, to have more freedoms. Most of those foreign postal administrations have more freedoms, more business freedoms than the U.S. Postal Service has. Okay, can I have one thing there, too, on the subject of privatization versus corporatization? Uh, Bill has described what's going on in some foreign postal administrations, and, and frankly, the term privatization usually implies a change in ownership for a public uh, institution. And in most foreign, in, foreign postal systems, they have, rather than privatized, gone to corporatization, which is a more, uh, a more business-free, more liberalized type of uh, environment in which they can operate, but they are still owned, at least on a majority basis, if not, if not entirely, by the government of that country. There is a distinction in those terms, and sometimes when we use the term around here, it gets kind of fuzzy about exactly what we're talking about. Some of them have also uh, given uh, stock ownership to their employees, which I think is a, is a pretty good solution uh, because it makes the employees owners, and owners have a, have a stronger look at, at how money is spent and so forth. Okay. Mr. Shays. I'm just going to uh, reiterate a question and put it more in a request. I hope that it will be the goal of the post office to try to get the mail out before 1130 uh, and continue to move it closer to that 9 o'clock figure um, so that all Americans are getting their mail a little sooner. Um, and um, then I just want to follow up with, with a, a few other questions uh, as they relate to, first, uh, labor issues. Uh, I'm struck by the fact you're very labor intense. Uh, I have met some very happy uh, uh, postal employees, uh, most of them very dedicated. I've met some very angry postal employees, uh, and, and they have extraordinary work rules in some cases through the collective bargain process that preceded you, and they're almost captives of their own, their own system. Um, my sense is that you have about 800 employees right now in that range? 800,000. 800,000, and that you ultimately you're going to have to get that number down to 500,000, I mean, with automation and so on, that, that that is a, a, an effort. Is that an effort? Or am I well, the number will drop with automation, but uh, how far it drops depends on how much more mail we get. See, we've gotten um, 9 billion more pieces of mail, and uh, we've had to open uh, 3 million new delivery points, which means we have to have new post offices. And, and so as long as we're growing, there will be people um, increased. Um, which raises me to the whole s question of facilities. Uh, in, in our area, the post office sometimes rents or leases facilities rather than, than owns them. And I'm struck by the fact that you really back yourselves into a very untenable situation. Uh, take a suburban community where you don't have a lot of commercial uh, space. Uh, once you, your lease runs out, you don't have many options or places to go. And it seems to me that it becomes the seller's market and not the buyer's market. Did we waste a wonderful opportunity during the last few years when we went through a, a, a crunch with uh, real estate not to buy into some properties? And is that one of the unfortunate aspects of the 700000 that we will pay dearly for in the years, $700 million rather? Only on a very limited basis, yeah. uh, Congressman. As I said, there are still facilities that we did not have not built, in, particularly in smaller communities, that, as a result of that. But, but uh, the answer to your question basically is no. I don't think we've missed those opportunities. We are not generally in the practice of, uh, of buying land or, or, or buying up buildings uh, on speculation, on a speculative basis that we might need them. But if we know there's a need there or if we know if a, a lease is going to expire, then we, we're, we're on it right away. You have a unique challenge, though, in suburban communities. I mean, you need, you need your trucks out there. You, you need that kind of space, yet you need your, your facilities in a in an accessible place. Is one of the tendencies, I mean, is it conceivable that, say, uh, four suburban communities where you have post offices in each, that, that you'll combine uh, with automation and so on, that you'll combine uh, the sorting into one town and just have so-called um, stores? Is that, is that the trend? That's very much yes. the basic operating concept of the Postal Service and has been for the last 20 years. If that is the trend, I hope that the stores, when, it's a very frustrating for people in suburban communities to get those yellow slips because they weren't there during the day, and they got to go pick up their mail, and they got to do it at hours that aren't convenient for them. And uh, if you end up, I hope the stores will be given those yellow slips and not 
you have to come to that main Yeah, that's a real parts, challenge, parts and we're going to try to do that, yeah. Pardon me? Yeah, I think very much that's a challenge, and, and we've, we have extended, for example, our window hours and the availability of some of our retail facilities, uh, but there's still more to be done in that area so that the, the hours are more convenient for exactly the kind of people you're talking about. I could talk to you guys all day, but I... <laughs> <laughs> does that mean you're back? Or is that <laughs> no, I... Thank you. Uh, we all could talk to you all day. Obviously, we have a great deal to discuss, but uh, the hour is getting a bit uh, late in terms of the legislative schedule. So with that, uh, we will call this portion of the, uh, of the subcommittee meeting uh, to, a, to a close. Uh, Mr. Runyon, thank you so much, and along with Mr. Coggle and Mr. Henderson for being here this morning. Uh, you will be returning after our series of hearings for a response, and I'm sure at that time we'll have other questions. Uh, the, the question, as, as Mr. Sanford said quite often, of privatization, and whether it means corporatization or privatization depends on whom you're talking to at the moment, is one that all of us hear when we go home. And I have said repeatedly that in my opinion, the burden of proof is, is upon the shoulders of those who, who believe that we should put those for sale signs up in the, in the windows of every post office in America. But, and I believe that. But uh, having said that, however, I do think that those who feel that the current structure is a, is a, is a meritorious one, who feel that it should continue have a burden of proof as well, and that is to try to establish the best possible system. And that's why this subcommittee is here to respond to your needs uh, in as much as we can. And we have some, I think, very laudable ideas on paper. What we need to do is work together to try to bring them off the paper and into, into hard proposals. And we are at your disposal to do that. And I think it's critically important that that process begin as soon as possible. So we're looking forward to that. Again, gentlemen, thank you for being here. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Chairman. Yes, Ms. Collins. Skip the opening statement for ranking minority member Carter Collins could be entered for the record. Certainly, without objection. Thank you. Okay. Uh, for the benefit of the uh, subcommittee members, uh, without objection, we will be submitting. Uh, uh, questions to the postmaster and his staff uh, in writing, and uh, we would anticipate responses to those. So if you could uh, forward those to us, uh, we will add them to the list and do our best to see, see that some information is provided in return. Uh, next portion of our panel, next portion of our panel uh, is Mr. Michael Motley, who is Associate Director of the Government Business Operations Issues General Government Division of the United States General Accounting Office. And he's joined by Mr. Campbell, whom I will uh, defer to Mr. Motley for introductions. Uh, Mr. Motley, if you were here to the beginning of the previous panel, you know that it is full committee policy to swear in all witnesses. So if you two gentlemen would rise. Raise your right hand and answer, do you solemnly swear that the testimony you will give before this subcommittee will be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? I do. Thank you. Mr. Chairman. Yes, Ms. Collins. Uh, I'd like to uh, state for the record that Congressman Major Owens and Jean Green are in uh, welfare, welfare Reform Committee markups, and that's why they're not here. And if without objections, their statements can be entered for the record. Certainly, without objection. We understand that the new rules of the House uh, uh, doing away with proxy voting has pushed enormous pressure upon the members, and we understand they're not being here in person, and we'd be happy to accommodate that. Thank, Thank you. you. Uh, with that, uh, we will uh, turn the floor over to Mr. Motley for his opening statement. Welcome. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Mr. Chairman, Ms. Collins, uh, we're pleased to be here, other members of the subcommittee, to uh, participate in the subcommittee's oversight hearings on the U.S. Postal Service. First, let me introduce Jim Campbell to my right, who is an assistant director in the General Accounting Office and responsible for our audit activities at the Postal Office. Our testimony today will focus on an overview of the key characteristics of the Postal Service of today and challenges that will face the service in Congress as they consider how mail service will be provided in the future. I'd like to ask Mr. Chairman that my full statement be provided in the record. I will certainly summarize. Without objection. Okay. I think it's important, Mr. Chairman, that we recognize very briefly, even though Mr. Runyon covered some of these things, that we're talking about an organization that has 850,000 plus people. 
We're talking about one that's changed substantially since 1970 Act uh, when it was turned into the uh, U.S. Postal Service. Uh, we're talking about one that has uh, processes about 177 billion pieces of mail a year as a uh, contrast to 87 billion pieces of mail in 1971 and has a revenue of approximately $50 billion uh, a year. Uh, in, in 1971, we were talking about $6.3 billion. Uh, we're talking about a very, very large organization. There's much discussion today and speculation about the inroads into the Postal Service's business caused by electronic communication alternatives such as fax and email. However, Postal Service data show that mail volume uh, is still growing. Volume was up 4.7 percent in the first quarter of 1995 compared with the year before. Less than 5 percent of the mail today is personal correspondence between households. The rest is either between households and businesses or between businesses themselves. Mr. Chairman, before I begin to discuss the challenges facing the Postal Service in some of our related work, I believe it's important to remind ourselves that the 1970 Act required the Postal Service to provide universal mail service at uniform prices that are fair and reasonable. To help accomplish this, the service was given the exclusive right to deliver letter mail and exclusive access to mailboxes. The right to deliver letter mail was given in a set of laws originally enacted in 1792 called the Private Express Statutes. However, advances in communication technology, competition from the private sector, and the possible enactment of legislation affecting the services monopoly over letter mail could affect the size, structure, and overall mission envisioned by the 1970 Act, many of the things that you all have been talking about today. Increasingly, the private sector companies and new technology are supplanting traditional mail services. Uh, we have reported on how the Postal Service lost most of the markets in overnight delivery and parcels to the private sector several years ago. Major losses of Postal Service business could trigger more frequent and larger postage increases and could lead to further reductions in the services business. Most of our work in recent years has relevance to current postal issues and significance to the service, the public, and the Congress. Uh, I will briefly mention a few of those issues. The first is postal labor management relations. Last year we reported that poor labor management relations persist because of an autocratic management style, adversarial employee and union attitudes, inadequate performance management systems, and the nature of the work. Four of the six contract negotiations since 1978 have required that a third party intervene to settle major differences. Current talks have been stalled by disputes and impasses since November 1994. And as Mr. Runyon indicated, uh, things are still going slow. Uh, our report, we recommended that the parties develop, and those parties would be the leadership in the Postal Service as well as the unions and management associations, a long-term agreement on approaches to remedy this labor management climate. In November 1994, as Mr. Runyon indicated, he called for the principal parties to participate in a summit to address the issues in the report. Management associations agreed, but the major unions declined to participate until the uh, current contract talks have been completed. In view of these difficulties, this subcommittee could help by monitoring the progress of the parties and requesting periodic progress reports on developing and implementing a framework agreement. Regarding customer service, the Postal Service knows it is below postal standards and falls short of customer expectations. Altogether, our work in the customer service area indicates that the service faces a difficult and lengthy task in changing its processes and improving service in expect to expected levels. Now, Mr. Chairman, I'd like, if you could, just turn very briefly to the chart that's uh, the last chart in the testimony under the <coughs> figures. It's uh, figure five. And basically, this shows that nationally, service and customer satisfaction have remained about the same during the last several years. The results are published quarterly. In the first quarter of 1995, 85% of households across the nation rated overall service as good to excellent, and 84% of the first-class letters arrived on time. This is the same rating reported for o overall service three years earlier and one percent point increase on on-time delivery from three years ago. The service's goal for on-time performance is 95%. There is no specific numeric goal for customer service. I just bring this up because the Postal Service has a long way to go, Mr. Chairman, in trying to reach the goals that it's trying to set out not only for customer service, but some of the things that I believe have been addressed by the subcommittee members already in on-time delivery. 
In an increasingly competitive environment, customer service has become a more critical to the survival and success of both public and private entities. Therefore, this subcommittee may wish to more fully understand how well the Postal Service is meeting the needs of its customers by requesting information about both residential and business customer satisfaction levels. I would like to make a few comments about automation. Automation has been a key Postal Service strategy for reducing cost growth and maintaining reasonable postage rates. The service is continuing a $5 billion, 16-year effort to barcode virtually all letters and sort them automatically into delivery sequence. This week we reported that automating mail processing and achieving savings have been more difficult to accomplish than anticipated. The service has not been able to achieve the personnel reductions that were once projected and financial savings have been small relative to to total operating costs. We believe it is important for the oversight committees to fully understand the total cost and benefits of major uh, postal initiatives such as automation in terms of savings, efficiency and service and they may want to request specific data on parts of the automation program as it progresses. And finally, Mr. Chairman, the growing pressure of competition for the Postal Service. Service delivery problems together with persistent labor management relations problems and other challenges have increased the calls for basic reforms of the Postal Service. Recent developments <coughs> include proposed legislation to turn the Postal Service into a publicly owned corporation and a coalition uh, recently asked the Postmaster General to initiate action to suspend letter mail monopoly over the third class advertising mail, which I understand he's just uh, declined to do so, to consider that proposal. The PMG just testified that the Postal Service is, uh, should be given more operational flexibility in several areas to improve the postal system. Fundamental issues that surround the emerging debate on, on the future of the Postal Service include how competition will affect the Postal Service revenue, cost, and rates and ultimately the federal government's role in mail and merchandising delivery. The private sector's capacity to effectively assume responsibility for mail service in this country and three, the impact on the, on the economy and the people of this country of such a change. In summary, Mr. Chairman, the Postal Service affects virtually every person and business in this country. Major changes to the Postal Service could have an impact on the quality, price and availability of mail service and could also affect the work of more than 850,000 employees. In that context, the Congress needs comprehensive and accurate information on postal operations in order to be able to carefully consider what changes should be made to improve this important service. This concludes my prepared statement, Mr. Chairman, and we look forward to con our continued working relationship with the sub subcommittee and its members. And uh, Mr. Campbell and I would be happy to take any questions that you may have. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Motley. Uh, uh, you've heard uh, in the testimony and the questioning today from some of the subcommittee members, and I'm sure it's a topic of great discussion uh, virtually anywhere the issue of the Postal Service comes up about privatization. Yes. And for the purposes of this question, we're talking about total divestiture of, of public involvement, government involvement in the, in the Postal Service and turning over to a private uh, firm. I know that GAO has been uh, doing some evaluation of the of a entire range of, of those kinds of proposed changes and looking as well at the experiences of other countries, such as mentioned by by Mr. Sanford. Uh, can you share with us some of your preliminary observations on the on those analyses? Well, <coughs> the analysis that we're doing with regard to uh, what you would term the privatization or the competition type issue, Mr. Chairman, uh, has re not recently gotten underway, but we're looking at various segments of it. Some of the uh, results of that have not been solidified at this point in time. However, uh, we do hope to have that information available by the end of this year. Uh, as you have suggested, as many others have suggested here, this is a, a very complex area. But I might suggest that all the talk that we've had here with regard to the 1970 Act, one of the things that we need to keep in mind is that that act was set up to ensure fair and equitable service to everybody. And that should be some of the uh, bottom line starting points for many of the people, not only in the subcommittee, we believe, but the Postal Service and the country to consider when we're suggesting making changes. I hope our work will be able to demonstrate to some extent uh, the kind of changes that might impact on the Postal Service if certain segments of the uh, Postal Service were to go away as a result of competition or as a, well, as a result of either commercialization or privatization. Mm -hmm. uh, with regard to the information regarding countries, we're just in the process of taking, uh, visiting some of the countries uh, to more fully understand the details of how they have gone about privatizing 
or commercializing uh, or, uh, as uh, Mr. Coughlin uh, suggested, uh, uh, more uh, corporation-type uh, organization. As uh, we understand it, most of those countries also had a male monopoly, and most of them have held on to, to some extent. And so I think that might be very important in our analysis as well, and be happy to share those results when they're available with the committee. I, I assume the studies will also look at, if it exists, <coughs> where changes and, and, and uh, a, a diminution of postal involvement in certain areas might be a benefit. I mean, I'm not saying well, it would be, but if we're that's... We're hoping uh, okay. uh, some of these things aren't absolute, Mr. Chairman, as you might suspect. Mm -hmm. Some of these will have to be run on if this happens, here are possibilities that could take place. I believe the information that will be developed uh, probably wouldn't have a bottom line that would say you ought to do this, mm -hmm. but would certainly lend information to the debate to consider uh, when changes are being uh, uh, made. All right, thank you. I, I know Ms. Collins, as, as many of us do, has another appointment, so I'd like to uh, yield to her at this time. Well, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, I find it interesting that you're visiting other countries um, to see if they're going into privatization or retaining a, a mo monopoly. Mm. I wonder, do you also visit other countries to see um, what kind of cooperation we could have in mail delivery, especially third world countries where it takes three to four weeks for mail delivery? Some recent work that we've been doing, Ms. Collins, deals with uh, the international marketplace, if you will. <laughs> and we have had numerous discussions with the Postal Service, and some of our work will include the kind of agreements that the Postal Service is attempting to work out with uh, a whole variety of countries that are involved in coordinating mail systems to ensure both uh, proper uh, accounting for that mail and revenues and expenses and whatever and to uh, <coughs> ensure that uh, there's proper communication among those countries. Do we have to pay other countries to deliver our mail? Our stamps, that's our revenue, but mm -hmm. what is the cost to them? It is, could that be a consideration of why they're so slow delivering our mail? Why not? It gets to be a very complex thing, uh, Ms. Collins. Uh, maybe Mr. Campbell could address it. The, the, the short answer is yes, we, we do pay other countries for the delivery of U.S. mail in-country, and they in turn reimburse the U.S. Postal Service for incoming delivery. Uh, those, the rates and so on are, are worked out through the uh, Universal Postal Union, which uh, includes about 180 plus uh, uh, member nations, uh, as well as through bilateral agreements that have been uh, made by the U.S. Postal Service and certain other countries, such as Canada. Mm -hmm. But uh, there's reimbursements on both ends I for in-country delivery, yes. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Motley, please explain the results of your investigation into the racial and gender investigations of the Postal Inspection Service narcotics investigations. Yes. Well, as you know, Ms. Collins, we issued that report a while back, and uh, what that basically showed that a large uh, portion of the investigations uh, <laughs> Uh, the, it showed a distribution of the racial mix, as you well know, of the investigations that were done by the Postal Inspection Service. Many of these things were highlighted, I guess, as Mr. Runyon alluded to, by the sting that went awry. Um, as a result, I believe, of our work and as a result of some of the failed things that have taken place there, the Postal Service has made a fair number of changes with regard to their investigations with regard to paid informants. Uh, that work also... Uh, suggested that, um, uh, that, that these investigations were uh, across a very broad range of locations throughout the country. Um, it was uh, more factual in nature in providing the kind of data that the Postal Service had with regard to the investigations that were done into uh, illicit drugs, use of drugs in the Postal Service. And finally, GAO has consistently found that Postal Service automation is not producing the savings originally projected. Is that still true today? Has that performance improved? Do you know what steps uh, the United States Postal Service is taking to improve the performance of its multi-billion dollar automation program? Uh, as you well know, Ms. Collins, we have uh, reported on that on numerous occasions and I think testified before you and said, Gee, they didn't meet their goal this year and they didn't meet the goal this year, uh, even though they've made some little pieces of progress over time. The report that we released yesterday 
uh, to you and the chairman and to the Senate Governmental Affairs Subcommittee on Post Office and Civil Service, mm -hmm. highlights a variety of the problems that the Postal Service has been having in not only barcoding the mail, being able to read that through the optical character readers, and I think it was uh, Mr. Henderson said that's been a big problem area. They haven't had the technological advances there. And in addition, the savings, especially with regard to the workforce, have been very difficult to recognize. And the Postal Service may meet additional challenges in this area because of some of the changes they have uh, recently made with regard to hiring more permanent employees and uh, less uh, transitional employees who they could move out of certain areas of the Postal Service as automation started to take over. Mm -hmm. Also, um, we're losing so much money in the metered mail fraud. I um, spoke with uh, Mr. Runyon, I think last week or week before last, and, and he says that they're really getting up to speed on, on the new machines coming in. But have you seen that? or? Well, we are hearing those kind of things, and it's our intention to revisit that work. As you know, last year we issued a report dealing with uh, uh, meter mail fraud. Uh, part of that report basically highlighted some of the problems that existed for years and years uh, at the Postal Service that the Postal Inspection Service had identified. Right. And one of the things that, uh, of course, got us involved in that was Mr. Runyon's statement that uh, he felt as though that maybe we were losing about $100 million a year. Uh, we're talking about uh, 1.4 million meters out there. And if I recall the numbers correctly, it's about uh, 600,000 of those were subject to some kind of tampering that uh, could defraud the Postal Service from revenues. Mm -hmm. uh, we understand that uh, some of the major m meter manufacturers have taken some major strides uh, since that report was issued uh, to try and make improvements in their meters. And uh, there are plans as well to cancel out some of those meters that, are, that were currently active. I don't believe all of that has taken place at this point in time. Thank you. Certainly. Thank, thank you, Ms. Collins. Thank you, Ms. Collins. Mr. Sample. I think I'm going to lose all credibility here with this next question. Uh, <laughs> in that uh, I had some questions here uh, relating actually to the letter mail monopoly. Um, but I, I just stepped out for two seconds to meet a constituent uh, from Myrtle Beach, uh, from my home district, who small world of small worlds, worked for UPS. And uh, he said he'd been listening to testimony and uh, said, uh, well, you know, we've got uh, 303,000 employees. We had revenues of $19.5 billion last year. Uh, we're one of the largest uh, employers of Teamsters in the world in terms of union constraints. Mm -hmm. And yet we made $800 million last year. Again, and I don't mean to be on this privatization kick, but what no. would be your response to somebody like that that says, we worked under similar, many similar constraints, and yet we ended up making $800 million. How'd they do it? Sure. Uh, well, I, I, let me just, if I may, sure. take one quick answer to that, give you one quick answer, and I'm sure Mike can uh, add as something as well. The, uh, it, the, I, I recently calculated the, the, the revenue per piece of mail uh, for the U UPS as well as the U.S. Postal Service, and it came to about $6 for UPS per piece of mail, uh, and it was 28 cents per piece of mail for the for the USPS Post Service. Mm -hmm. Now what that indicated to me is that they're in a very different kind of business. They're, they're certainly charging very different prices for p per piece of mail. So that, when you start talking, when you talk about the total revenue uh, received, it is, for, for the uh, UPS, it's very substantial and it compares. You know, they're in the freight very, business and you're in the yes, information business. In terms of t revenue, but uh, they're not delivering anywhere near the, the, the numbers of pieces of mail Mm -hmm. I mean, it's a very different kind of business. Uh, so. What do you think, though, about, and I, again, I stepped out, um, the letter mail monopoly, necessary or unnecessary? Well, uh, I think it would be a little bit difficult to say, gee, it's not necessary, let's do something. I think we're talking about something that was started back in uh, 1792, and it was created for a reason, and one of those reasons that I think we need to keep in mind is it was to keep the Postal Service as a viable financial entity. In other words, it recognized that the carriage of mail was going to be costlier in some locations than it was going to be in others. and One was going to balance the other off. And I think in terms of looking at the 1970 <coughs> Act, looking at the mail monopoly, you have to consider those things. There have been some inroads to the mail monopoly 
uh, as suggested in my testimony in some areas. One was overnight express mail. 1971, the Postal Service had 100 percent of the market. Uh, today, in the express mail area, they have about 12 percent of the market. And so we have to be careful with things, and as, as suggested in the testimony as well, and just turned down Mr. Runyon, the coalition suggested a, a, uh, some inroads to that as well. Uh, I think those things have to be considered very carefully. Some may be very <coughs> appropriate and be good. Uh, others, I, I, I think uh, we need to be careful with. Mm -hmm. in, in order that we don't erode the kind of balance that was initially intended, and if the Congress wants to keep that kind of a balance, then that's one of the things they need to consider. I have no further questions, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Ms. Sanford. Uh, revisiting the issue that uh, Ms. Collins brought up on automation, uh, I, I don't think there's any question when the Postmaster General made his statement, he and, and uh, the other members suggested they have some technical problems that you know, they, they would assume responsibility for. But in one of the direct questions, I believe, posed by Mr. Shays, the postmaster seemed to suggest that the reason they haven't seen a, a greater drawdown in the number of personnel is because of the what he characterizes as an enormously substantial increase <coughs> in the volume of mail. Mm -hmm. uh, thereby, by at least suggesting that the automation program isn't quite as uh, behind the curve as, as may at first appear. Uh, what's, your, what's your perspective <coughs> on that? Are, are, is that part of the mix, or do we have a real problem on the automation side of the equation? I think it is part of the mix. I think the volume of mail has created some of the problems. Uh, however, some of the problems, uh, again alluded to by Mr. Henderson, were the remote barcoding sites. There was a significant problem there. <coughs> there were over and uh, maybe Jim can help me out here, I believe 186 of those lo uh, locations that were supposed to be in place to process approximately 30, mil 30 uh, billion pieces of mail, and we ended up with 25 of those locations in place that processed significantly less than that, I think about 6 billion pieces of mail. That started to erode the problem. The <coughs> technology that was available to read the mail created a problem as well. While I think some of the problem was attributed to uh, volume. Uh, we need to keep in mind that the optical character readers today are only reading about half of the mail that goes through those optical character readers. That means it has to be processed some other way, and that other way is a more expensive way. Um, I think those things. With regard to the workforce, and I alluded to it very uh, shortly, but in 1989 we made uh, a definite uh, move to hire transitional employees who could be replaced by automation, actually, and they, the, the Postal Service could let them go. In other words, we could have had a reduction in the total workforce of the Postal Service. There's been a change in that philosophy in the last year or so where transitional employees now, some are being moved into permanent positions, but more permanent employees are being hired. So while we saw a dip in the early 90s in the total workforce, we're basically back up to a total workforce where we were. Um, when uh, some of the greater emphasis was put on uh, automation in 1988. So, so is the automation a question of too high expectations and just when you get to put it on the ground and operating, it, we learned that uh, beyond anyone's reasonable ability to project it, it didn't function as we'd hoped, or is it a problem of not pursuing it in the correct way? Uh, I think it's a combination of all three. I think it's a combination of having greater expectations than we ended up with, and one of that, that part of that is technology. Well, I think excuse me, but were those expectations reasonable at the time? It would be difficult for me to suggest that they were reasonable. Maybe Mr. Campbell has a different view on that. I think they probably were considered by the Postal Service to be reasonable at the time, and uh, <laughs> they, uh, and uh, we didn't make any deter determination at that time. Our report basically looked at what was claimed to have been the, would be the results of the automation program versus what has actually occurred. And there's quite a gap there, as we pointed out. I think we should emphasize that we're not, we don't, we're not opposed to automation. We don't think there's no, no. anything inherently no. wrong with automation. Uh, and uh, it surely has made a difference in, in, the, in the processing of the 177 billion pieces of mail. Uh, the, the, there are numerous problems in the management or the 
in the program, including management of the program. Lots of obstacles, and it's a long, it's, it's, they still have a long way to go. Yeah. Uh, years yeah. left to go. In terms of the, why it's not reduced the, the workforce, uh, the, uh, uh, the, the workforce, ha as we point out, has not been impacted. It's grown with volume. Uh, and, and the real difficulty is no one knows what impact automation has had on productivity. A lot of the gains that uh, have been made could be related to pre-sorting of mail by mail. Uh, pre-sorting of mail. Uh, the mail comes in already ready to be delivered, uh, in effect. So it's hard to isolate the impact of uh, automation on the workforce or uh, productivity or efficiency. So, yeah, I, I want to make it clear for the record, I'm not opposed or ha have uh, uh, harbor objections to automation either. What I'm trying to <coughs> help myself understand is I talk to various uh, parties of interest in this whole question, is that those who are claiming that this has been a, a total failure of management, and on the other hand, those who are saying that uh, the, the failure to see a drawdown in personnel levels, and in fact, uh, we've seen that we've come back up to, yes. to right. pre-downsizing levels suggests that uh, the Postal Service, uh, from a management perspective, lost an enormously uh, opportune moment to, to affect that, and that was the intent, and they blew it. I, I don't know what the answer to that is, but that's really the, the line of reasoning or questioning that I, that I have. Uh, I'd well, like to interrupt my questions right now. And, uh, acknowledge the arrival of the gentleman from Maryland, Mr. Ehrlich. Uh, uh, I don't know if he would like to make a statement for the record or... Uh, uh, I understand. Well, you can submit it without objection, and I'm not going to object, so I guess you can submit it because it's you and me. <laughs> Thank That's you, Mr. Good. Chairman. All right, well, we'll, uh, we'll come back to you. Mr. Chairman, if I yes, could just Mr. summarize. I, I see three things when we talked about... Uh, we talked about expectations. That's one. They were probably a little high. We talked about management. In 1992, management was changed significantly, and a lot of the emphasis in the automation area changed. Uh, as was inferred by Mr. Uh, Runyon, they're trying to get that back up to speed again. I, I agree with you. We lost some momentum there. We lost mm -hmm. an opportunity to keep that ball rolling. And I think the other thing is the employees themselves. So we have, w when I say the employees, what I'm saying is, I won't say there's a resistance to this automation, but it's something new and we're having difficulty getting them into it. There's a lot of people, according to the Postal Service uh, Employee Opinion Survey, that don't think this management or the, that the management of the automation program has been run very well. So a lot of times there's not much buy-in. Yeah. Thank you for that clarification. Yes. Uh, b back in 1990, there was a big brouhaha about the uh, allocation of costs uh, for the for the rate increase, the 29 cent stamp, and at that time GAO, as I recall, suggested that there be some changes to the, the nine point rate, uh, rate setting criteria. One of those, for example, was uh, uh, recommended that demand pricing, you know, the value of service be uh, to the center be given greater weight in these <coughs> criteria. It has, and there was virtually no action taken at that time. Does the GAO still feel that that is a problem of concern, and are those recommendations made still valid, or would they rather change those today? Well, I, I think in light of a lot of the comments that have been made here today about uh, the kind of things that the Rate Commission could do or should do, is we need to revisit some of those matters. Uh, whether demand pricing is, is, uh, should be at the top of that list today or not, but we, uh, is in question in my mind. and. Uh, while we made those recommendations back then, I think we might be dealing with some different situations today. Mm -hmm. I think we need to look at that criteria, but we need to look at it very carefully. But could we uh, make a request on behalf of the subcommittee that perhaps that uh, revisitation occur? Uh, obviously, that would be enormously helpful and instructional. Sure. We'd instruction be happy to do that, Mr. Chair. Absolutely. Thank you very much. Uh, let me ask you a question about uh, the future, and that's the intent of automation, and we're having a great deal of discussion, the PMG spoke about <coughs> it, <coughs> with respect to email and, and, and faxes and the potential erosion of, of postal customers through those new technologies. Uh, I think I have the sense that the postmaster and, and the postal service in general sees itself having a role in those future technologies. Has GAO had a 
an opportunity to, to think about that? Do you even believe that that is something that the Postal Service should inject itself into, or should it confine itself to the more traditional delivery of the mail? Uh, difficult question, Mr. Chairman, I, I mean to make a, a, at this point in time. Last year we testified before the House Post Office and Civil Service Committee regarding technology in the Postal Service. We suggested that there are there is a, a possibility of a large erosion in uh, the mail stream as a result of changes in technology. And Mr. Runyon suggested that over the past five years there has been approximately a 35 percent erosion of uh, the mail volume as a result of uh, technology changes and, <coughs> and further will take place in the future. I think it is really one of the things that uh, not only this subcommittee but uh, the Postal Service should sit down and discuss very thoroughly before decisions are made mm. to have the Postal Service go off on different, uh, different routes. Mm. Well, we, we certainly will be uh, looking at that because it is obviously a very vital question as to what the future of the Postal Service <laughs> might be and, and if you get into that area it, it again uh, puts into question uh, uh, the issues involving privatization and the Postal Service competing, et cetera, et cetera. So, We'll be looking to work uh, with you on that as well. Uh, we do have a vote that's been called on the rule for the regulatory moratorium bill. Uh, I would be happy to come back if Mr. Ehrlich uh, has a, a desire to submit questions. Otherwise, uh, due to the hour, uh, we could submit uh, questions uh, in writing for the record. And I assume that uh, Mr. Motley, GIO, would graciously respond to that. Be this. happy to, Mr. Chairman. My involvement with um, HR 450. Yeah. Well, you have business on the floor. Well, and I'm going to make an executive decision then, for all that it's worth, uh, the first of the day for me that uh, we will uh, end this and go vote. And uh, to both of you, gentlemen, thank you for being here today. We will submit those written questions. And uh, yes. I see. And uh, with that, I would adjourn the uh, subcommittee until Thursday, the second of March, when we will hear. Uh, from the members of the Postal Rate Commission. Thank you all. Thank you. This was the first in a series of oversight hearings which are intended to provide members of Congress with an overview of the present state of operations of the Postal Service, the nation's largest civilian employer. Next week, officials with the Postal Rate Commission are scheduled to appear and the Postal Board of Governors are scheduled for March 8th. C-SPAN, a public service created by America's cable television companies. Here's a look at the C-SPAN schedule this evening, all times listed here.